Welcome to the second lesson on the WSO2 API Manager. In this lesson, you will learn how to work with APIs. This lesson will cover publishing and managing APIs, an introduction to OAuth2, and consuming and subscribing to APIs. Let's begin by learning how to publish an API. Users of the publisher are API Creator and API Publisher. When you log into the API Publisher for the first time, you get the option to deploy a sample API to test out the API Manager functionality. When you are creating an API, you can begin by importing an existing API definition or WSDL of a SOAP service or design a new API. API creation is the process of linking an existing backend API implementation to the API publisher so that you can manage and monitor the API's lifecycle, documentation, security, community, and subscriptions. Alternatively, you can provide the API implementation inline in the API publisher itself. Let's create an API. When you create the API, first you enter the name as you want it to appear in the API store. Next, you enter the URI context path, which will become part of the API's URL. The API version is in the form of version.major.minor and also becomes part of the URL. Visibility settings prevent certain user roles from viewing and modifying APIs created by another user role. The visibility values mean the following. A public API is visible to all users, subscribers and anonymous. Visible to my domain is visible only to users who are registered in the API's tenant domain. And restricted by roles means the API is visible only to specific user roles in the tenant store. When restricted by roles is selected, a new field called visible to roles appears where you can specify the user roles that have access to the API in a comma separated list. No spaces. For this example, let's change ours back to public. Next, let's choose a file that we're going to use for the thumbnail image. The image can be 100 by 100 pixels. Next, we enter a description for this API. Specify something that helps the user understand why and when they would use this API. Any number of tags can be entered separated by a comma. Tags allow you to group or categorize APIs that have similar attributes and behaviors. When tagging, always use relevant keywords and common search terms. Once a tagged API gets published to the API store, its tags appear on the dashboard as links to the API consumers, who can click on them to quickly jump to a category they are interested in. An API is made up of one or more resources. Each resource handles a particular type of request and is analogous to a method or function in a larger API. The URL pattern for the resource can be one of the following types. A direct mapping or a template which performs a pattern matching. Using a template gives you the option of adding parameters to the resource path when invoking the API. The HTTP methods specify the desired action to be performed on the resource. Multiple methods can be selected. Parameters, as we said before, can be added to the resource. These parameters are used when invoking the APIs. In this example, we're adding a phone number parameter and a license key parameter. You could also import an existing Swagger definition to create the API. When creating an API, you can begin with an existing API endpoint, or use a SOAP endpoint, or you can design and prototype a new API. The purpose of a prototyped API is to give API users an early implementation of the API so they can use it without subscribing, comment on its effectiveness, and request improvements. An endpoint is a specific destination for a message, such as an address, a failover group, or a load balance group. WSO2 API Manager supports a range of different endpoint types, allowing the API gateway to connect with advanced types of backends.
An HTTP endpoint is a REST service endpoint based on a URI template. An address endpoint is the direct URL of the service. Failover group endpoints are the endpoints that the service tries to connect to in case of a failure. Load balance endpoints are where incoming requests are directed to balance the load. And the default endpoint sends the message to the to address specified in the message header. You can specify a production endpoint and a sandbox endpoint. A sandbox URL is used for online testing of an API with easy access to an API key. For the endpoint security scheme, you specify secured endpoint or non-secured endpoint. Default is non-secured endpoint. If secured endpoint is selected, the user is asked for credentials of the backend service. Enable destination-based usage tracking to generate a graph showing the number of times an API accesses its destination addresses. This graph is generated in the API Manager Statistics dashboard. It gives API publishers insight about the requests that leave the gateway to destination endpoints, which is especially useful in cases where the same API can reach different endpoints, such as load balanced endpoints. Let's add the production endpoint for the phone verification API. You can now specify a message mediation policy for this endpoint. You can specify a policy for messages that are coming in on the inflow, for messages that go out on the outflow, and for when there is an error. All API contexts are suffixed with an API version. The default version option allows you to mark one API from a group of API versions as the default so that it can be invoked without specifying the version number in the URL. Throttling allows you to limit the number of hits to an API during a given period of time. The API Manager comes with three default tiers as Gold, Silver, and Bronze. Each tier defines a maximum number of requests per minute. Bronze allows one request for the API per minute, Silver allows five, and Gold allows 20 requests for the API per minute. In addition, there is also a special tier called Unlimited, which allows unlimited access. The transport protocol on which the API is exposed can be HTTPS and or HTTP. By default, both of these transports are selected, but if you want to limit API availability to only one transport, such as HTTPS, uncheck the other transport. Hard throttling limits the total number of calls the API manager is allowed to make to the back end. While the other throttling levels define the quota the API invoker gets, they do not ensure that the backend is protected from overuse. Hard throttling limits the quota the backend can handle. Response caching is used to enable caching of response messages per API. Caching protects the backend systems from being exhausted due to serving the same response for the same request multiple times. If you select the Enable option, specify the cache timeout value in seconds within which the system tries to retrieve responses from the cache without going to the back end. Subscription is used to specify the tenants who can subscribe to an API in a multi-tenanted API manager deployment. The following types of subscription categories are available between tenants. Available to current tenant only means that only users who are in the current tenant domain, which is the tenant domain of the API creator, can subscribe to this API. Available to all the tenants means that users of all tenant domains in the API manager deployment can subscribe to this API. Available to specific tenants means that users of specified tenant domains as well as the current tenant domain, that is, the tenant domain of the API creator, can subscribe to this API. Scopes enable fine-grained access control to API resources based on user roles. You can define scopes to an API's resources. When a user invokes the API, their OAuth2 bearer token cannot grant access to any API resource beyond its associated scopes.
An API can be in a different status at different times in its lifecycle. After creating an API, it's not visible in the store until you publish it. A prototyped API is visible internally in the store for testing purposes. Deprecated APIs are available to existing users only, while retired ones are removed from the store. APIs can also be temporarily blocked. Remember that once you publish an API, it's visible in the API store and it enables API consumers and app developers to subscribe and use it. The default API lifecycle contains the following states. Created means it's not visible to subscribers yet. Prototype means it's visible internally in the store to try it out. Published means it's visible to subscribers in the API store. Deprecated means it's available to existing users only. Retired means it's unpublished and deleted. And blocked means that access is temporarily blocked. With the integration of the registry lifecycle to the API lifecycle of WSO2 API Manager, it is possible to extend the existing API lifecycle and customize it according to your preference. An API is the published interface, while the service is the implementation running in the back end. APIs have their own life cycles that are independent to the backend services they rely on. This life cycle is exposed on the API Publisher web interface and is managed by the API Publisher role. The importance of proper documentation cannot be overemphasized. You can add different types of documents to an API. Proper documentation helps API publishers to market their APIs better and sustain competition. You can add documents from the API Publisher UI and from Swagger. Let's take a moment to learn more about Swagger. Swagger is a 100% open source, standard, language agnostic specification and a complete framework for describing, producing, consuming, and visualizing RESTful APIs without the need of a third party or proxy service. Swagger allows consumers to understand the capabilities of a remote service without accessing its source code and interact with the service with a minimal amount of implementation logic. Swagger helps describe services in the same way that interfaces describe lower-level programming code. The Swagger UI is a dependency-free collection of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS that dynamically generates documentation from a Swagger-compliant API. Swagger-compliant APIs give you interactive documentation, client SDK generation, and more discoverability. The Swagger UI has JSON code, and its UI facilitates easier code indentation, keyword highlighting, and show syntax errors on the fly. You can add resource parameters, summaries, and descriptions to your APIs using the Swagger UI. API Manager allows you to define the version before the context, such as 1.0.0 slash service name, allowing the grouping of API based on the versions. You can define the API's version as a parameter of its context by adding the version parameter into the context. For example, curly bracket, version, close curly bracket, slash phone verify. The API manager assigns the actual version of the API to the version parameter internally. Note that the version appears before the context, allowing you to group your APIs according to versions. A tenant is an isolated domain. The users within this domain can manage their own data and perform their own transactions without being affected by actions carried out in other domains. Now, let's learn about OAuth. OAuth stands for Open Authorization. It's a free and open protocol built on IETF standards and licenses from the Open Web Foundation, and it allows secure API authorization in a simple and standard method from desktop and web applications. OAuth 2.0 is the next evolution of the OAuth protocol, which was originally created in late 2006. OAuth 2.0 focuses on client developer simplicity while providing specific authorization flows for web applications, desktop applications, mobile phones, and living room devices. Tokens are used to gain access. These tokens have a limited capability and a limited lifetime. It's like a valet key. It means that this user has signed up and they have subscribed to a particular set of APIs and this token gives access to those APIs. OAuth 2.0 defines four roles. The resource owner is an entity capable of granting access to a protected resource, such as an end user. 
A client is an application making protected resources requests on behalf of the resource owner and with its authorization. The authorization server is the server issuing access tokens to the client after successfully authenticating the resource owner and obtaining authorization. The resource server is the server hosting the protected resources capable of accepting and responding to protected resource requests using access tokens. The client sends an authorization request to the resource owner, which sends the authorization grant back to the client. The client sends this authorization grant to the authorization server, which responds with an access token, which the client uses to access the resource server, which responds with the protected resource. OAuth2 provides several grant types. Code means when you enter the username and password required at the service provider, it will result in a code being generated. This code can be used to obtain the access token. Implicit is similar to the code grant type, but instead of generating a code, this directly provides the access token. Password authenticates the user using the password provided and the access token is provided. Client credential. This is the grant type for the client key and client secret. If these two items are provided correctly by the service provider, the access token is sent. Refresh token. This will enable the user to obtain an access token by using the refresh token once the originally provided access token is used up. SAML uses SAML as the grant type to obtain the access token. IWA NTLM is similar to the password grant type, but it is specific to Microsoft Windows users. Let's look at how we consume APIs. A typical user of an API store would be a subscriber, that is, an application developer. The subscriber role is already there in API Manager by default. Users can self-register to the store. The self-registration option is available for anonymous users. Users who sign up are assigned the default subscriber role. For API store administrators, there is the ability to attach an external BPEL workflow to the sign-up process. You subscribe to a preferred API by selecting an application. An application is a logical collection of APIs. It allows you to subscribe to one API multiple times with different SLA levels. To subscribe to an API, you must use an existing application. There is a default application, but you can create one as well. An application is needed because access keys and throttling restrictions can be given for each application. An access token is a string passed in the HTTP header to authenticate users to invoke APIs. Application access tokens authenticate an entire application. They are used to invoke all APIs listed under it. User access tokens are used to authenticate the end user of an application. You can use the API console in the store to invoke an API. Here we are invoking the get method of the phone verification API. When you click try it out, it creates the curl request that is sent to the API, and you'll see the request URL, the response body, and the response code. You'll also see response headers. You can now try out the lab exercises for creating and publishing the Pizza Shack API, working with tenants, subscribing to APIs, and invoking the API. This concludes the second lesson in the series. Thank you.